Awesome. In that case, let's give it up for our first keynote speaker, a visionary leader, CEO, co-founder of Rockset, and my dear friend, Venkat Venkat Ramani. Thanks, Shruti. How's everybody doing? It's it's absolute pleasure to be here to kick off the, the this edition of Index. And I was talking to my second son yesterday on how should I open this? What, what are some inspiring things I could say? And he said, uh, why are you asking me? Ask ChatGPT. <laughs> and so let's do it. Live demos, you know? Hey, ChatGPT, I'm about to kick off the opening keynote of Index 2024. You're here live on stage. Can you open us up with some inspiring words? Absolutely. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Index 2024. It's a privilege to be with such a talented and innovative group of minds, both in person and remotely. Today, we come together to push the boundaries of what's possible in search, analytics, and AI. Let's inspire each other, share groundbreaking ideas, and make this conference truly transformative. Here's to an exciting and impactful Index 2024. I couldn't have said this better. <laughs> what an exciting time to be alive. What is, I need a clicker. So what an exciting time to be alive. I think this is truly an incredible time. And before I get into the details of the keynote, I wanted to extend a big, big thank you to every one of the incredible lineup of speakers we have. Uh, you know, we're all here to learn from them, pick up an ideas or two on how they've solved problems, how they build massive scale search applications, AI applications, ML applications. So please join me in giving them a big round of applause. And if you think about the pace at which the space is moving, it's, it's unprecedented. Right, uh, you know, I watch, I listen to a lot of history podcasts and there's always this what if scenarios. What if this had happened? What if th that had happened? You know, imagine someone in the summer of 2022 went into like a cryo sleep or a medical induced coma and they're gonna wake up, let's say 10 years from now, they will have absolutely no idea about all the everyday tools that each and every one of us are gonna be using to get through our days. And that is how fast you know, things are, things are, are in, getting innovated and things are moving. And the really incredible thing about this is that there's no end in sight. Models are gonna continue to get bigger and better, learn new abilities, and this is just, we're just scratching the surface on all the applications that people, people are gonna imagine on this. Your assistants will continue to get smarter, they'll become agents. Just like how you delegate information access to some applications, you're gonna soon be delegating certain permissions and privileges for these assistants and agents to act on your behalf. I was uh, listening to an interview uh, of a CTO of a, um, a dating uh, application company, and they, were, they are now you know, evaluating building a language model, uh, a fine-tuned language model for every single one of their users, and they're gonna let each user's digital twin have conversations, it dates with other digital twins, and ask each of them saying, did you enjoy the conversation? And using that, they're gonna you know, see, you know, find the best match for, for people. So this is just scratching the surface on all the possibilities that are in front of us. And this is coming at us at incredible speed. But are models alone enough? Do we have everything to take to build these amazing AI applications? There's only one problem, that abilities without knowledge it's not so useful, right? If you can't remember anything, if you can't you know, have authoritative answers for you know, knowledge-related questions, and you just have a bunch of abilities to reason, ability to recall, it's not enough. And so if you really truly think about it, every one of these language models and every one of these AI applications is gonna have to combine the state-of-the-art language models or, or any kind of AI model that you're using along with a world-class retrieval system that can give you access to real world data, real world information. So you need memory, you need knowledge, and you need a place to store all of them. 
and then there's gonna be a, a lot of low latency, kind of high bandwidth interaction that is gonna happen between the model and your data retrieval system in order for the AI application to actually come to life and actually be able, you know, useful and build delightful experiences for, for your end user. And so, if you look at that closely, what you realize is that every AI application is in, inherently a search application. And so, what that means is, by corollary, all AI applications demand very, very powerful data, retrie data retrieval systems. And if you think about what makes a data retrieval system powerful, it comes down to three things in my book. It has to be fast. Who wants to work with a, you know, an application that is slow and sluggish? But it's not just it has to be fast. It has to be fast over a wide variety of knowledge bases. It could be structured data sets you have or knowledge bases full of text and language or even unstructured data. It has to be easy to iterate. Every search application, people would know that worked on it, the, you know, it's all about search quality measured in precision recall and what have you. And so if you think about how to improve search quality, the only trick in the book is to do a lot of iterations. You have to be able to constantly iterate, tweak something, try again, change a weight, try again, do a lot of A-B tests. And, and as your application changes, as your corpus changes, as your use cases changes and your product evolves, you have to know, you have to be able to constantly iterate. And so that is gonna be very important. And last but not least, your applications have to interpret the world as things happen in this, in this, in this space, because you, know, you don't really want your you know, agent or your assistant to make decisions, which you know, is not really keeping up with the world. You wouldn't even allow an agent to book flight tickets for you if it doesn't know how to read the news, for example. And so, in order to really build these snappy, high-quality AI applications that can keep up with the world, you really need a powerful data retrieval system. And so, let's dig in a little bit. What do we, what do we mean by hybrid search? So, a vector database and a vector search might be enough to build a cool demo. You know, you, put, you throw in a bunch of things and you can suddenly demonstrate something that is possible that was very hard or, or, you know, to imagine without it. But every production use case that I have seen and our, you know, when we are working with our customers and they're all telling us is, is a combination of different kinds of data, right? You have to in, you know, include uh, traditional text keyword search engines and search ranking alongside vector search to actually build a really good similarity search application. You have to you know, include vector search and other structured um, you know, data sets like permissioning to actually build uh, uh, you know, an application or a chatbot that understands you know, who, gets to, uh, who gets access to what information before it can answer a question. And so every single search is actually a hybrid search in every production use case. So you want your data retrieval system to be very good at not just one kind of data, and you don't want to be building systems where you use a, a text you know, search engine, and then you have a, a vector database, and you have a secondary indexes hanging off of your OLTP systems, and some special purpose systems like geospatial indexing and what have you. And you don't want to be like duct taping all of this together in order to kind of build uh, compelling experiences. It's going to be, first of all, slow. Second of all, very inefficient to iterate on ranking and relevance. And so your quality is going to suffer. And most of all, the operation complexity is going to be insane. And so you don't really want to do this. You want to really have one system that integrates all of this. And the second thing is, again, iterating quickly on precision recall and other search quality stuff, it's not just about different indexes you can build and fast retrieval, it is also about very flexible ranking and relevance and how quickly you can iterate all of them. So you're gonna be building some change of your application or iterating that, you're gonna be deploying, you're gonna be tuning, changing your weights, changing your biases, retrain your models, and you wanna be able to do all on the fly and as flexible and as fluid as possible because there is a lot of you know, rinse repeat going on here and you have to be able to build systems that can, that allow, or, or have infrastructure that allows you to do it. And last but not least, you have to be able to interpret the world in real time. Would you really trust an AI assistant with a short term memory loss? I don't know if many of you have seen the movie Memento back for, by Christopher Nolan. Um, so dealing with hallucinations is one thing, but dealing with anterograde amnesia I don't want AI apps that have that, that cannot make new memories. And there's a scene in this movie where he starts a fight and he doesn't know who's fighting who and who's the good guy, bad guy, and who's trying to kill who. And so if you haven't watched the movie, go watch it. But coming back, I think, you know, we, we talk about real-time indexing and ingest from like a streaming standpoint and data standpoint, 
all along. But in this new world, this is going to be like an implicit requirement. This is not going to even be called out. People will just simply not use AI applications that cannot keep up with the world. If you have an agent that knows how to read the news, you would trust it to book flights because if something really breaks out and you're like, hey, hold on, I probably shouldn't make the booking until I get confirmation, you want your agents and your assistants to be able to have that you know, access to what's happening in the world and be able to keep up with it. Without that, it's just not going to work. And so it is my absolute pleasure to announce Rockset Rebuild from the ground up today, uh, you know, optimized for hybrid search. Thank you very much. There is a whole series of things that add up to this. Uh, we've rebuilt our indexing format ground up, optimized for hybrid search for fast retrieval across different corpuses of data. We're releasing new sets of ranking functions uh, for building unified ranking and relevance. So again, you can iterate really quickly. And last but not least, on an existing data sets and existing collections on Rockset, you can now create and drop indexes and manage them uh, you know, live retrain indexes and you know, ANN and other kinds of indexes. And you can do all of that with compute compute separation so that your search queries are completely unaffected because the compute used for search um, you know, query serving is completely isolated and separate from, uh, you know, from, from the compute that is needed for rebuilding and retraining your indexes. And as, as is everything in Rockset, everything works in real time. And so all of your indexes are mutable in real time. And so I cannot wait to see all, what are all the amazing applications you're all gonna build by combining you know, world-class AI models with, you know, with, with world-class retrieval systems. And I would love to understand more about what's happening in this space, what's happening to various AI models, where is this world going, and what's happening to the retrieval systems and how our data architecture is evolving to keep up with the times, and who better to talk about this and learn more than Reynold. Uh, Reynold, give, Please. Reynold, Reynold Shin is a co-founder and chief architect at Databricks. He leads the development of core data systems, including Apache Spark, Delta Lake, Photon, and Databricks SQL. And he has a PhD from UC Berkeley and specializes in uh, where he specialized in large-scale data systems. And he's the original author of the code, model abilities, without knowledge is not so useful. And so, without further ado, please take a seat. Right. Thanks so, for uh, having me here. Absolutely. I took some notes uh, to help me with this. So, Databricks released DBRX. GPD-40 just came out. There's so much development happening in this space. It's a How do you see it? Progress we have to yes, how do you see this? Like, models continue to get better, but what new skills will they develop? What, do you see? What are the, the scaling factors and, and what, what is really going to determine what kind of abilities these things are going to acquire? Yeah, uh, I think one thing that's pretty clear is that nobody knows exactly where the world will go. Um, I, you know, even the people that are working at the very frontier of the systems don't fully understand the systems. Um, when there are so many parameters, it's possible it's intelligence, it's possible it's not. Nobody really knows. Um, I think anybody that really claims they know is probably um, a little bit overly confident. But one thing is very clear is pretty much in all dimensions we, we are seeing today and a lot of the limitations we're seeing, they will improve, right? The boundary of the models become better at math, the models become better at reasoning. Um, and sometimes it's not just about the model, it's about the system people put together using sort of these models. Um, costs will substantially go down. The uh, hardware sort of GPU shortage hopefully will go away um, reasonably soon. Um, probably not in the next months, but sort of in the next sort of year or two. Um, and um, so I think really a lot of the, so what, what people are seeing today, I think they were first, everybody was super sort of surprised by, hey, all the capabilities of what these models can do. And then they started using it, they realized, hey, in this area is not doing super well, and the other area is not doing super well. And there's some skepticism also building up. But I think uh, if you look at progress, uh, it's bound to happen that um, so slowly, um, a lot of those weaknesses will be. Uh, what can you tell us about DBRX? How does it, how does it compare with other you know proprietary models and whether it is GPD-40 or other things people are building? Yeah. 
So maybe for people that don't know what DBRX is, um, it was a model that was released about so maybe two months, a little bit less than two months ago. Um, at the time it was released, um, so we joke about this at the time. We knew about this coming, uh, but at the time it was released, it actually scored uh, fairly well. And maybe if you look at a sort of a collection of open source, or a collection of model benchmarks, um, it's one of the best open source models, and maybe even the best. Um, and then Llama 3 um, came out, so two weeks later, and then uh, took the spot. Um, the, and we expected that. Um, but the reason we built it, we spent a lot of, we spent about $10 million in compute uh, to train it. Um, and, it's about, um, and the reason we built it wasn't necessarily, hey, we think this will be state-of-the-art model going forward. But the reason we built it is we sort of put together, we really wanted to stress test the entire Databricks mosaic um, AI infrastructure that a lot of our customers are using to do training, fine tuning, and all kinds of uh, some model building LM applications. We really want to stress test how well it will work and what would happen if we were to build a model from scratch. And that if you should go back to the announcement blog, one of the things that maybe people didn't pay as much attention to, but I think it's a very important sentence, is it's really about um, Everything we have done um, to build DBRX is now available for anybody that wants to use the Databricks to do this training. Um, and that's uh, pretty remarkable. Thank you for that. Uh, super exciting how, how quickly things are evolving. So let's, let's move to the enterprise kind of like applications that are built for the enterprise. And there's a lot of data and knowledge bases that are within the enterprise that needs to get integrated as part of these systems that, that people are building. And so there's a lot of data within the enterprise that is not crawlable. Yeah. So you can't train on them and all, the, all these other, uh, you know. Uh, you the know. enterprises can. Exactly. Open AI well, or market. Yeah, but even, even there, there's like all these permissioning, yeah. who has access to what information. So like what, sh what is your take on the best way to unlock all of that? Like unlock the true values of these models within the context of the enterprise where all of these kind of permission data sets are, are, are being present. Yeah, I mean, one thing that's uh, pretty obvious is what you just announced. Um, but I think RAGs uh, should play an extremely central role um, in this. As a matter of fact, when I look at sort of the um, type of application, the LM applications people build on Databricks, about 60 to 70 percent of them already kind of use the RAG-based architecture. And I think that's a very essential part of that. Um, one of the things that's um, so very interesting is while the models are getting better and better um, and very quickly, um, they are mostly trained on, as you said, publicly crawled data. Um, the, and your enterprise data often look different. You have some very domain-specific things that are just simply not available um, on the public internet, and those are very difficult um, to feed into a general model. You probably don't want them to feed into a general model because that's your competitive advantage anyway. Um, so I think, um, I do believe a lot, RAG will play a very important part of it. Um, there's other things like fine tuning um, in domain specific context that I think would also be pretty important. Tell yeah. us how the data architectures are evolving. I think um, Databricks is pioneering this whole concept around compound AI systems. RAG, I think, continues to get better and feels like it's here to stay because there's always going to be permissioning and other true knowledge kind of access that AI applications are going to need. But beyond RAG, like what are you seeing? What kind of data architecture, what kind of components are being added and how should people think about it? Because I think the one big fear that everybody building infra for this is that the models are continuing to get you know, so much better. You know, is what I'm building just scaffolding to work around problems or inabilities of the current model? And I have to rebuild all of this again you know, six months down the line or a year down the line? And just how, how should people think about it and what are the patterns you're seeing? Um, so I do think that fear is real. Um, and models will get better, and a lot of what we do today are to work around models. But also I think there are things that are very fundamental um, to the models themselves that would probably um, do, so, which give the significance to the term compound AI systems. And it's not just a Databricks term, like a lot, many of my co-founders are authors on so that blog that talk about compound AI systems. Um, you should Google that if you haven't read it. Um, but the, the whole point is, we're, we are moving away from just, ha like when people think about LLM AI applications, they often think about there's a model. There's some input into the model and the model spits out some output and that's my, the entirety of my application. But it's pretty clear that um, what the world cares more about are the systems that can actually do this. And when you think about it, the holistic systems approach, 
there's a lot more that you can do beyond sort of the capabilities of a model. Um, and a whole system approach could be as simple as, in its simplest form, is literally just a model. Um, a slightly more complicated one is maybe let's start doing RAG. And by the way, once, the moment you move to RAG, it becomes a lot more complicated. So chunking, sort of, um, what are embedding models, what are the reasoning models, maybe what are summarization models. Now you start introducing a much more complicated system. And a lot of the sort of like general software engineering system thinking have to come in. It's like, if I have, say, a second budget, how much do I give to the embedding model? How much do I give to the rack retrieval? How much do I give to the summarization? Um, and the thing that's pretty interesting here is, um, first of all, the more you can do divide and conquer, the actually easier it is to evaluate individual components. And um, LMs are no different from traditional machine learning in the sense that you want to be able to evaluate, it's an iterative process, you want to be able to evaluate, you develop, evaluate, and get more data, and reevaluate again. Um, and this, but when it's extremely general, it's very, very difficult to evaluate. As a matter of fact, nobody knows exactly how to really evaluate a complete general uh, model today. There are sort of, um, like for example, Chapel Arena and all that, but they ask very simple questions. Nobody really knows how do you define it. Is ChatGPT4 really, is like, is GPT4 really better than whatever Anthropic came up with? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but if you scope it down to much more um, specific cases, now, uh, for example, hey, how well does this model and this part of my system work with summarizing so maybe five paragraphs of a text into one paragraph? It's a much more tractable problem. And with much more tractable evaluation, now you could actually experiment and build better and better models over time. Um, so I think a lot of this, um, so one is just, once you have more specialization, you start putting up maybe different models and compo components together, it makes it easier to evolve individual pieces. Um, but there's a lot more stuff like permissioning, um, I guess we, when we talk about RAG, um, permissioning is a very important thing. You have a lot of enterprise data, if you, Used to, if you sort of had to model internalize the data and become the knowledge base, it becomes virtually impossible to control because models are not deterministic. Um, but if you have something that does retrieval and use that to enforce permissioning, um, that's a much easier way to do that. What are the popular use cases you're seeing? Uh, DBRX yeah. is, is, is cutting edge. There's so much history that Databricks and Spark has in the ML and the AI, even on the training side and a lot on the inference side. Uh, I think you also have like a vector database that is, uh, that is provided. So, so I'm sure you have a lot of access to lots of different use cases. What, what, are, the, what are the most interesting ones that have caught your eye? Yeah, so uh, we've been sort of saying we're the so enterprise data and AI company for probably like six or seven years at this point. Nobody really pay any attention to the AI part until like November 2022. Um, the, and there are so many, uh, like in a way, even though, even before sort of ChatGPT came out, I think there are a lot of AI applications that developed it, except they're very in silos and weren't getting a lot of attention. Like for example, we had a customer that were using AI to uh, sort of identify the gene that's responsible for chronic liver disease. Um, and then they developed a drug uh, for that. Um, so for example, areas like personalized medicine, um, AI had already had pretty massive um, implications and impact on the whole field. Um, there are sort of, um, people that are building sort of, uh, uh, sort of code generation bots. Um, this is actually what led to the Mosaic AI acquisition. Um, so uh, we ourselves are very extensive users of our own models, um, but not just our own models, but also other open source models. Um, like for example, one pretty cool use case we have is we realize um, all of the, we have a lot of tables and data sets on Databricks that are managed um, so by our customers. Um, vast majority of them don't have any context or description associated with them. And this is just human nature. You create something and move on. Just like most of the world's codes are not very properly documented. Um, the, so we built, but there are in absolute numbers also a lot of tables and data sets that had descriptions. Um, so we basically built a model from scratch. Uh, which we fine tuned a model. Um, based on existing data uh, descriptions for each customer. Um, and then um, that model is now used to suggest sort of descriptions of uh, data sets 
and it provides much better result than whatever sort of models um, off the shelf that we can get um, because it's now um, has the context for specific sort of individual customers. Um, and now um, it's only been two or three months since we um, released it. Actually, close to 90% of all table descriptions in Databricks are generated by that model um, as opposed to sort of human written. Wow, that's awesome. Are there particular industries, have you seen any use cases in particular industries that have caught your attention um, you know, outside of code gen? And you talked a little bit about how it's you know, uh, impacting personalized medicine. Are there any other industries that you're seeing, uh, you see as like uh, early adopters of AI and moving very fast? Yeah, um, I think finance has always had a very strong sort of AI, even way before all of this. Um, ad tech is like another one. Um, they're very classic optimization um, theories. The, but what, what's really exciting is I think a lot more, um, even some traditional industries that you wouldn't think of associated with tech or AI are doing this. Um, another one, one of my favorites is actually Bechtel. Um, they are the construction company, 100-year-old construction company that builds up the world's largest project, like Hoover Dams. Um, they realize, hey, if they feed 100 years of uh, construction um, sort of project documents um, into a model and tr sort of, uh, train the model, um, they could not have the model spit out better construction sequencing um, than what sort of, their construction planners can do. And in a large project, construction sequencing would have a massive impact on the actual cost um, and timeline sort of, of the uh, construction because uh, I don't know how many of you have sort of done a house remodel um, and how many times it happened that, hey, I needed just doors to be installed, but then I forgot to order it um, without, without enough lead time. As a result, now I'm stalled and I'm waiting for that. Now imagine magnify that, so sort of multiply that by a thousand times for a billion dollar project. Um, so that, that was super cool. They actually estimated they improved, I think about 5% productivity oh, wow. because of this model that they built. Um, and 5% in an industry that hasn't really seen any efficiency gain for the last probably like 50 years was a massive improvement. Um, and I think that's what I look forward to the most is how AI is gonna change sort of a lot of maybe fields that Silicon Valley don't typically think a lot about. Um, and it's really going to fundamentally change the economy. We're all obsessed with transformer models and LLMs, and uh, but there's a lot of different kinds of data sets out there, yeah. right? Very clearly convolutional, like, you know, neural nets work better for images yeah. and for different kinds of data, I assume different kinds of models needs to be built. Uh, any insights that you have on outside of like, you know, language models and, and you know, transformers, transformer based models, what kind of models or should people be thinking about to unlock like a lot of you know, enterprise kind of like data sets? Yeah, there? so the, we're chatting about this earlier and enterprise data sets, a lot of them are tend to be tabular, they are transactional. Um, and the, like for example, if you want to find outliers, yes, you could have an LM go look it up, uh, but it's highly unlikely LMs anywhere near efficient to look at a billion rows or even a trillion rows. Um, the, but recently, there's a conversation I had with the PhD student at UC Berkeley in robotics. It was pretty interesting. Um, he was telling me they're using LLMs a lot, and I was surprised because when, um, when you're controlling a robot, you have to be making thousands of decisions a second. And that's not the type of throughput LLMs can do. So I asked him, so how do you use LLM? And what he ended up telling me was really interesting. I think opened up a whole new sort of, uh, line of thought for me is, they, um, so robots are trained extensively using reinforcement learning and do a lot of experiments. And then there's sort of optimization functions um, and bootstrapping they have to do. And those are done previously by humans. Like somebody manually think about how you should construct all of this. Um, now they're actually leveraging LLMs to be writing a lot of them and using LLMs to evaluate how well they would work. So they're not necessarily using LLMs in actually deciding how you move or control the robot. But using LLM to bootstrap the entire model um, sort of training process for that robot. And, the, and that was super refreshing to me. I was very surprised um, to hear. Um, and I think the analogy here is, I think there will be a lot of traditional models, linear models, of random forests um, that people should be training and should be using 
for their more tabular data sets, they'll be far more efficient than LLMs. Um, but which one do you use? How do you use them? Nobody knows, right? If you have a PhD in data science and you go in and you spend a lot of time looking at the data, yeah, you could figure it out. But otherwise, it's virtually impossible for most people. When I look at a large table, I have no idea how should I define sort of anomaly. How, what model should I be using to uh, track? So what's interesting to summarize? I think that's where um, LLMs and models can help massively. Um, and so again, maybe going back to combining AI systems, you're thinking about how do you combine um, so more state-of-the-art LLMs with a lot of traditional models and maybe using the LLM as a decision maker in, in building a system. Um, I think that would likely yield the best result. That is awesome. That's a great insight. Use LLMs not to actually, you know, do the in, you know, inference whether it's an anomaly or not, but help you build a, a very high quality system. Exactly. So that's awesome. We have about a minute left. I have, I want to finish with like one uh, open-ended question, which is like, what is your hope or dream on where this space could go in the next year plus? What, 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 what is the change or what is something that you would like to see, you know, come true or, or people work on? Yeah, um, I was I actually recently discussed this topic with a VC friend of mine, and uh, he jokingly said, um, I hope in the next year I get to date a model, either <laughs> an actual human model or a LM model created by my portfolio company. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, uh, on a more serious note, um, I think there are two areas that I always tell people, hey, if I'm not sort of at Databricks, maybe I would actually go try to solve, and one of them is education, the other one is medicine. Um, I think both of the, this have the following sort of um, in common, which is um, there are pretty good sort of educators and sort of doctors out there. Um, if you ha have sort of the right connection in the right geography, in the right economy, um, and you know the right people and have enough money. Um, but re most of the world don't have access to that. Um, and I think, AI, it, even today, the models are probably good enough to be used um, to dramatically improve um, sort of state of the art for sort of, um, education in most countries and most areas. Um, they, in, in a way, you could already do that, right? I could have ChatGPT. I could set up an iPad with ChatGPT and in, and give it right enough prompts to like teach my daughter, who's only three and a half year old, certain topics, and they can do a pretty good job. Um, but this system I set up, which is an iPad and my prom and all that, can't scale. Like uh, some some rural village in China or India is not going to sort of, like who, who whose parents are likely illiterate are not going to pick up an iPad and start building this whole thing. Um, so I think there is sort of a massive opportunity here, uh, both in terms of economic value to whoever they can actually do it. Um, and to the world that um, if we can sort of come up with the right system to leverage AI uh, to sort of democratize education and democratize medicine. Um, yes, it's not gonna be as good as if you have a professor from Stanford um, teaching you sort of a programming language, um, but it should be able to go pretty far. Um, and whoever wants to do that, please also let me know. I would love to help you uh, with that. Um, that is awesome. With that, that concludes our first session. I'm looking forward to all the other amazing talks today. Okay, let's give another round of applause for Alan. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.